Hey, it's DBJ. Um, I'm going to talk tactics in this uh, video, and I may have to split it up into multiples, but uh, we'll see as, as I start to rant and rave. Um, battle tactics. Not necessarily for players, although um, players could use these tactics in their game, but this is more for GMs and GMs who are um, storytellers trying to come up with an idea on using um, various creatures for various tactical reasons. And the reason why I'm just putting this down as tactics is because oftentimes, uh, definitely myself included, when playing um, medieval games especially, we get into this habit of like, open the door, creatures waiting there, let's roll the fight. And unfortunately, it, it creates a habit in the players' minds as to, you know, how to proceed in a game. And by establishing the same repetitive encounter, not encounter type, but encounter uh, tactics, some players will shine over others. And I'm going to segue a little bit into the, uh, the OP, the overpowered um, conversation, that some player characters are more, are more overpowered than others. And this seems to be more evident in 5th edition... Uh, than as a matter of course rather than of building type in uh, Pathfinder. And I have to dispute people who say that, you know, one, one type of player character or character creation is more powerful than another because they're all based on the situations they're placed in, okay? So if, um, if everyone's playing a game where they have the funnel of death, where, you know, you, you, know, you open the door... Everyone funnels into the door, and sitting in the middle of the room is the creature or the horde of creatures or the swarm or whatever have you. The player characters will end up, the ones that most uh, benefit tactically from that kind of, of um, interaction are going to seem like they are more powerful than another. And I've always brought up this the idea of like, the monk versus uh, the wizard, everyone says, well, they've got these ranged spells, and the minute they get to the level where they can cast fireball, you know, all they're doing is just throwing fireballs into hordes of creatures, and, you know, they're, they're doing, like, you know, uh, straight off the bat, like, 8d6 damage or something, and that's unfair. Well, sure, in a 50 by 50 foot room, or sure on an open field, but that same mage throwing fireballs around on a sinking ship is is vastly, quote-unquote, underpowered to the monk who's fighting off the, you know, hordes of goblins or uh, or pirates that are attacking the ship. The the minute the, the wizard casts the spell, he's going to start burning the ship down, and that, that he'd kill himself more faster than anything else. And so anyway, it, it it's all depends on situation. So... Uh, long story short, I I got this from a video game. Um, I can't remember the name of it, and I like using these tactics as describing them like animals. So I'm going to go through, um, state the animal, state what the tactics are, and then as a as a game master, so that you don't get in trouble for um, what, what's the way to put it by. Um, trying to get one over on your players, you could write these tactics down beforehand. Write them down. Say, hey, you know, um, I always use goblinoids as, uh, as, as the catch-all phrase for, like, bugbears and goblins, the hobgoblins. Um, and write them down. And then when the players feel like, you know, oh, man, you snuck in an extra 50 of these, or you did this, or there's n it's unfair that they did that. What you could do is then just open up your notes and go, listen, this is the tactics I decided to use. I didn't change anything. You guys stepped into a trap. All right. Let me preface this as well by saying that um, when it comes to perception checks, checking for danger, Checking around corners, are we being followed, those kind of things. Now what you can do is you can have levels of perception. Meaning that, um, for example, let's say there's um, a group of 
10 bugbears and there are three extra bugbears who are like scouts they're hiding in you know hiding in the woods or something so the players come upon 10 bugbears that you could make a roll have to make a roll okay well you you sense the 10 bugbears and you see their encampment but someone who makes a very high roll goes well you see that there's a place in the encampment where there are no bugbears, you may feel that they may not be back yet. Or, in addition, you know, the ranger or something, well, you see the encampment, but you also see tracks leading off into the distance. You, you can infer that they probably have a scout group out. And it could be multiple scout groups as well. So one portion of the party knows, well, there's the main, main group, there's a scouting party, and, then, and there's a raiding party. And you can kind of, depending on how high or low their perception uh, check is, or if you don't mind splitting the party up slightly or giving uh, various player characters some information, you can say, okay, well, one group knows one thing, one group knows another. They can start to split up and do their own tactical things, okay? And then you can keep in mind um, uh, cross attacks. So anyway, let me get started. Uh, the first one's going to be the turtle. And uh, very basic, the turtle concept is that the, the attacking uh, goblinoids, and I'm just using it as a catchphrase, you can use any kind of creatures you want, gnolls or what have you, um, or if they're semi-intelligent uh, giants or what have you, that they end up creating a perimeter around themselves so they cannot be flanked. They, no one can sneak up on them. Uh, think the classic maybe Roman or Grecian um, armies where they all have these like long, tall shields or if you look, think of the movie 300 where everyone gets together and they create this barrier of like shields or using their bodies or they don't even have to be that intelligent. They could be a bunch of ogres. They all turn their backs to each other and so that the enemy cannot surround them. This, of course, is a, a very smart, very intelligent uh, very common sense kind of thing, tactic, where um, it's almost more defensive, of course, using the term turtle, than offensive. But in, this look, in a situation where the party sneaks up on these goblinoids while they're in the woods and they have a campfire going, turning their backs to the fire and then having them all, you know, prevent themselves from being surrounded, it makes perfect sense. Does that mean that you're... you're, you're pretty much snatching the, the quote, you know, the backstabbing ability of the, of the rogue out of there. Of course it does. And that's the whole point. Um, uh, creatures that use that tactic, they want to protect their back. And if they trust each other enough, sure, that's an actual possibility. The other thing about the, about the turtle is that to get around it, especially if they're extremely defensive creatures, is to have the players provoke a reaction from them to get one or more of them to leave the protection of the turtle to to poke their 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 heads out to chase them down so that there is that opportunity so for example you come across the the 10 bugbears the three scouts join in you got 13 of them they all turn their backs they're like defending themselves maybe there's a, one of the player characters the fighter type or something like that or even the thief uh, the rogue or whoever has a couple of hit and run tactics. They run off into the woods, drawing some of them, the the number three or four of them after them, breaking ranks. And so now, as they're being chased, you now have their backs open to attacks and just using tactics. Okay, everything does not have to be roll initiative. Everyone jump the pile on the on the um on the wagon. It can be a situation where the other player characters sit back. One or two volunteer to go forward to be that target, at, to break ranks, splitting those creatures up. And then now you have the opportunity, the, the, the turtled group is maybe less powered. The ones that go after the, the running uh, PCs, now that small group can be surrounded, etc., etc. The other one is, um, another tactic to use is the scorpion. Now imagine a scorpion, two pincers and a tail that stings. And the idea of the scorpion um, 
can be where the two pincers are two generalized groups that strike forward. And what you could do is, using this as a battle tactic, is using the idea of like knolls, because I love knolls, right? And they're like hyenas, you know, they've got javelins or crossbows or something like that and ranged attacks. So you could have a group of, say, five and five. And the first group of five attacks. They throw some weapons, they, they attack, and they know they're going to receive uh, assaults coming from the other end. So group one attacks, and as group one attacks, group two waits. Group two waits, and when the PCs come after group one, group two comes around the side and strikes in again, like pincers, grab one, two. And the idea is to draw the PCs out and kind of pin them down, okay? So group, group A and group B starts attacking. They attack from different angles, maybe with ranged attacks, maybe in melee combat. And then you have your third one, and that's that tail, that tail that comes overhead. Now that could be either from um, an aerial point of view, if you have something that flies in your group, like manticores, uh, winged riders, uh, gargoyles, um, magic that allows them to fly. Um, they're up in the trees, they're on the cliffside, they're on top of the, the, the tower, any kind of aerial attack. Or if this group has a long ranged, they've set up a long ranged attack. So maybe they're hit, hitting up, hidden up on a ridge, they're hiding behind boulders, the, the double group of five and five start attacking the PCs. When the time is right, they come from behind the boulders, they start shooting their crossbows, maybe they got a, a ballista, they've got rocks, and start pelting the, the, the player characters. And so now the player characters are in a situation where they have this three-pronged attack. Two attacks close, one far away. So now when you have a, um, the spellcaster in a group that can affect a large group of of uh, enemies, they're going to have to split their attention. Okay, do I shoot the fireball up on the ridge? Do I use my lightning bolt on group one? Do I throw the fireball at group two? No, group two's too close. I'm going to catch my, my friends in it. That kind of thing. It also allows the opportunity for the group that's farthest away to run for it. You know, call reinforcements to reload and hide. So after they launch their attacks, they just hide. Can you see them? No, they're they're hidden back. They start reloading their crossbows. They got their javelins ready. They decide when to make that attack. They can also go after the other ranged members of the group. Go after the wizard. Go after the the, the ranger, the, the the elven archer, whoever, and target them because they've got the longest range attacks, allowing them or members of the farthest group group three or group C, the ones that are farthest away to run for it, to call for reinforcements, to allow the enemy to um, regroup and to send orders maybe back to the, the Knoll Chieftain as to what the group is capable of, how many are in the group, and to be smart about it. There's um, another tactic is the monkey. And surprisingly enough, the monkey is perfect for like goblins or kobolds or something. And uh, basically, it's a hit-and-run tactic. Uh, constantly moving, constantly using the environment, uh, never staying in one place, uh, going at full force. And so you would have this idea where the, maybe the player characters are poking and prodding through a dungeon. They're walking through the woods. They see an empty camp. They start you know, trying to go through the pockets of all the dead. And lo and behold... Group of five or six goblins come running by, pulling out their little daggers and short swords, maybe some poison blades. They run past, they attack, 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 and then they run for it. They go. Their, their job is just to steal items, to cut the belts of uh, the, the items that the characters have, maybe pour some acid or set fire to a backpack, to steal some spell components to break a bowstring, to um, set a cloak on fire, do, do all these things, to, to throw some rocks, to 
get the party to split up. Hey, the goblins run. Hey, I'm I'm the ranger. Um, hey, I'm the rogue. Well, we'll we're gonna we have the highest movement rate. Hey, I'm the monk. We're gonna chase after the goblins while the other party stays back and gather some of the things. And so, using the the monkey tactic, is is very much roll initiative, fight, boom, break out. Roll initiative, fight, break out, disappear into the woods, disappear into the dungeon, disappear down a rabbit hole. Um, absolutely a technique that would be used by, uh, by uh, Dark Elves, especially. You've got a raiding party. They already know where they're going to hide. They, they have um, hovels or you know, areas built into the um, stone underground. They jump out. They throw some attacks. Maybe, you know, throwing things through murder holes or small openings. Retreat, move a stone back into place to cover their tracks, and they're gone. And then a scout or two from a dis distance can see, you know, how does this affect the party? Did we get the spell components of the wizard? Did we cut the bowstring of that, that friggin' elven archer? You know, um, start diminishing their resources. Um... Stealing potions, breaking them, uh, setting fire, pouring acid on things. Um, it can be very, very disheartening for the, for the group, especially if they don't have the ability to chase them down or you attack the resources so now the things that they rely on are, are no longer available. For example, cutting the straps on a magic shield. You know, the straps are replaceable. But now the, you know, the fighter now can't use the shield. And you're like, well, yeah, but it's a magic shield. Now, yeah, the shield can survive, but the little leather straps, they're replaceable. Just like, any, no, doesn't work. No, you can't use it. Well, that's unfair. Well, that's the whole point of the tactics, to use those tactics to go after the player characters, to steal a, a magic sword or, or a dagger or a staff or something like that, to steal the wand, you know. Um... Another tactic that can be used by, um, by intelligent species is the falcon. And the falcon, similar to the monkey, the falcon is more interested in causing outright damage. They will assess the party, they will wait as long as they can, um, attack at full speed. Maybe they're mounted on uh, wargs or dire wolves or... Um, you know, war boars or, or, you know, panthers or displacer beasts. Pick something like that. Mounted combat. Maybe if they're flying combat, riding on the back of a griffins or manticores or uh, some other wyverns or something nasty like that. Come in for attack. They come far away. Boom. S strike quickly. Snatch somebody. One of the player characters. The first one they can take out, can knock out, can entrap whatever take them and they run for it and they take off again unlike the monkey the monkeys out there cause all outright damage you know pouring acid on a smite's cloak setting fire to a backpack destroying um uh, potions and stealing a wand but the falcon technique is we're going to come in we 15 wyvern riders are going to go after one guy the paladin. The paladin's been taking us out this whole time. We're going to pick one guy. We're going to pick one, maybe two. Hey, let's go after the spellcaster too. The darn warlock. We're going to pick them, focus our attacks on them from long range, come in for a me melee attack, bam, close range combat, hit them, and then we're gone. Take off. We've got the, we've got the uh, advantage of maybe height. We've got the advantage of hopefully speed with uh, mounted combat. And regroup like a jet fighter, dogfight, come, come around, go away, take to it. If the player characters cannot fly or do not have long range, fly up in the air and then come back again. And this way, what they can do is they can reassess, okay, we've hit, we hit the paladin, boom, they disappear. Paladin's not down for the count. Should we risk another another uh, strafing run? Sure, let's do another strafing run. They come in, they start throwing javelins from far away. They've got rocks and slings and things. They've got maybe spells or breath weapon or breath weapons or crossbows. Bang, 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 bang. Okay. Then when they get in the close range, they come in, sweep through, go after the spellcaster. Bam. 
hit them, then take off. Is this unfair? Hell yes. Maybe the, the rogue in the group is the one they really should be going after, but the spellcaster's been using lightning bolts and fireballs the whole time against the gnolls as they get closer to, to, the, to their uh, um, the, the battlefront. So they go after one person. They pick one person in the group and try to take them out. Um, another tactic would be the snake. And the idea of the snake is that instead of, you know, a horde of goblins or a horde of, um, of hobgoblins being in one big, large group um, held together, just, you know, almost perfectly sized for a nice, nice big fireball, they're stretched out, okay? They are in dis an indistinct line, if you will. And that line, maybe group of two or three, and then there's another one behind them and another one behind them, they each can, can watch the back of the next guy. And then the one at the very end, of course, can turn their back so that they are not going to be snuck up on. How this helps the snake, especially traveling through um, a dense forest, traveling through uh, caverns, by setting themselves up into a line, uh, it only means the one in the very front and back are the immediate targets, and the others can hide off into distance, move off the road, um, climb up into trees, and uh, establish themselves as, a, uh, as one long path as opposed to a big giant cluster. Now, the other thing with the, with the snake is that, uh, perception-wise, if the first guy misses something, the second one may see something, right? So the first one walks ahead, walks ahead, steps into a trap, they fall into a pit, it's spiked. Okay, the, the ones after that know and can be ordered to stop so that they don't all fall into the same trap. So if you have a uh, player characters have a ranger in a group and the ranger's like, hey, I'm going to set up a net and, and trap and snare all these, these guys. No, the hobgoblins are too smart for that. They set themselves in a long line. You can snatch the first one. Maybe, you know, this trap that you set up, maybe you can spring it on the second one. But the, the other 14 in line, no, it's not going to be possible. Also, as snakes do, um, snakes can lie in wait and spring out, okay? So you can have a situation where, um, say, 15 of them are hidden. They've got the, some camouflage. They've, they've put their fire out. They've surrounded their uh, encampment with nice camouflage. And so, as the player characters come by, one or two can strike out like, like a cobra and strike leaving the rest of the body of the group hidden to, to test the waters of the player characters. So one or two come out, they strike. Oh, hey, we only see one guy, the wizard. Let's go after them. Strike, strike, strike. Oh, the wizard strikes him down with a ray of frost. Uh-oh, the other group's like, holy shit. Okay, well, what are we going to do now? They can reassess. They're already, the body of the group is still um, held back. Um... The drow, of course, you know, dark elves would definitely want to use this tactic as well. Send out the lowest guys, you know, the, the, the ladies just sitting back. Send out the, um, the expendable men. Send out like three or four of them. See what the player characters do. See what the raiding party, these, you know, humanoid raiding party does to our dark elves. Assess their abilities. Okay, they have a paladin in the group. They've got a ranger. They've got some kind of sorcerer or wizard or something like that, a barbarian, and then reassess what's going on. The other thing about using the snake tactic is just like a snake has venom or a snake is like a, like a python and traps someone, they may have some kind of tactic to eliminate the player characters, whether it's like a knockout gas, a paralytic poison, um, a giant net, um, shackles and cables or putting the player characters with their backs to a very deep pit so that when the attack strikes it's like uh, striking like lightning and taking them out using very few people very few hobgoblins or what have you but you having a, um, a residual effect of like a poison or a net or being tr entrapped and take out those player characters splitting the party. Um, 
Another tactic which is completely opposite to the ones that I've said before is the rabbit. All right? The rabbit tactic itself could be running for it. Run. Hey, the goblins, they've got some some uh, items, they've stolen some things from some villagers, they've attacked uh, parties on the, on, the, on the road, the player characters go after them, and the first tactic they do is run. Turn tail and run. Player characters hunt them down again later in the game, they turn tail and run. The player characters for the third time, they see these goblins, the, the, the city leaders are like, please help us with these, these goblins, they keep attacking our... Um, coming into our farms and killing our animals and attacking our people and the player characters go after them and the, and the, the, the enemy just runs for it. This can be extremely frustrating for player characters who are like, I thought we were rolling initiative. Well, they, they made a perception check and they sensed you so they run for it. They're not going to fight us? No. They're not going to attack us? No. You're, you're far too, too big for them to attack. Uh, they run for it. Now, of course, you can, you know, anything goes bad. You got 15 hobgoblins and there's three left. Hell, hell yeah, they run for it. Okay? And maybe they keep running for it. Now, there has to be an end game uh, as far as them running. So maybe they sell their information to other, maybe some frost giants. And like, hey, we know this group is coming. They're really powerful. They've got a barbarian and this weird halfling with a uh, a loot who likes to juggle. There's a you know a warlock in the group. There's a ranger who really hates us and knows all of our tactics. Here's what you should do because this is what we've seen. Uh, we'll help you out. We'll team up with you frost giants to help attack them and get our revenge or something. So this also leaves story options open. You know the same enemies show up again and again. Maybe they, the, if you want to, you start adding levels to these characters, so the enemy just runs for it, all right? Um, another tactic, you know, I'm going to stop the tactics now, because this is getting kind of long in the tooth. I, I really hope that it will it'll upload. I've been having a lot of problems with them throttling my uh, uploading speeds, so I really apologize for that. But anyway, just using animals as an example of using tactics to attack and um, to defend yourself in the game as a game master. You can write these tactics down beforehand. Player characters say, hey man, you, you know, you're going after our stuff. You're taking away our magic items. You're taking away my spell components. That's unfair. You pick up the piece of paper and go, it is unfair, and I wrote it down. So be quiet. Playing a game that's organic and, and creative and not just destructive, and I don't mean destructive on pe player characters, um, characters sheets, but destructive in um, taking away that originality, that surprise, that when the player characters come upon a uh, an encampment with a fire, and then you find out that um, they're all, it's just fake, it's all like sticks with their armor hung on it, and then all of a sudden the hobgoblins jump out of the woods from underneath the leaves because they know that the, the player characters were going to come in there. And it was, oh, this was all a setup. It was a trap. I can't believe it. Well, you know, that'd be sweet, you know. And then the, the wizard who's trying to stay in the background shooting ranged spells, boom, they throw a net over his head, knock him in the back of the head, hit him with a poison dart, knock, knock him out, drag the wizard away, and then they run for it. And everyone's like, what the hell just happened? Where's the wizard at? Oh, he's gone. He's been kidnapped. Okay, we need to go after and find the wizard. Well, can't what the wizard can fend, fend for himself? No, he can't. He destroyed his uh, here's a his spell component bag, and there's acid thrown on it. And then last, you know, last couple of hours, some goblins ran through and they stole his staff. You know, tactics and everything. So anyway, it's DBJ as always. I like to be creative and uh, throw some surprise situations in there. Don't just have you know a horde of of uh, creatures just sitting in a room, sitting at a camp, sitting in a cave, just waiting for the players to come there. They should be doing something. Playing card games, sharpening weapons, poking their heads around, um, getting in fist fights, um, eating the, the raw leg of a, of a dead elf they killed last week, um, you know, 
picking the maggots off because those are the tastiest parts um, and, and you know those kind of things they should be doing these things they should be, be they should be smart um, creating traps uh, setting trip lines um, putting you know scouts in trees those kind of things if they're if they're not completely animalistic they should be using tactics and so uh, this can add a greater element to your game guys thanks for watching I'm DBJ and uh, as always create don't destroy